Okay, uh, we're going to slow down just a little bit. Uh, yesterday, in the last 10 minutes of class, I worked through quite quickly an important concept about relating sequential games and simultaneous games. And I know I went kind of rapidly. I just wanted to sort of expose you to that, uh, that idea. And I've, up in the overhead, I've put, um, for today's outline, I've, I've put, really put kind of two questions you want to look at. This first is, what happens if we represent and analyze, and I put those kind of in, in red because they're important, a sequential game as a simultaneous game? And in a way, it's kind of, this is where you put on your theory hat, and you say, well, there's a little intellectual curiosity here as we, we've got these two types of games, sequential and simultaneous, we looked at. How do they sort of connect together? And uh, this first question tries to look at that uh, or answer that, and we, we saw in the last 10 minutes that, um, of, of yesterday's class that you, know, you could do it, but you get this sort of strange result of multiple equilibrium. We're, I'll go back and, and look at that uh, again, uh, but I just want to address, that's one question we're going we're to try and look at. Just slow down a little bit about the idea of Nash equilibrium, what's going on, what these uh, uh, multiple equilibria mean in the, when we analyze the sequential game as a uh, simultaneous game. Now notice I, I, I put in red, represent and analyze because we're not changing the game. Okay? It, it's true we can change games from si sequential and simultaneous. You know, sequential is, well, one person can observe what the other guy does, and if you cut out that ability to observe, then you can make it into a simultaneous game. That's a different type of analysis. And, and we'll, uh, we want to be able to do that, but that's not what we're doing. We're trying to think, oh, okay, these sequential games, people have strategies. What would happen if we just took the strategies for people later on in the game and match them up for strategies for people earlier on in the game and do our little payoff table and look for the Nash equilibria. How do they connect with the rollback? Okay, so that's basically what this question one tries to address. Question two uh, says, oh, okay, if we can um, take a sequential game and analyze it as a simultaneous game, could we think of a simultaneous game as a sequential game? And the answer is yes using an important idea called the information set, which helps to show that the game tree structure could really represent simultaneous games or sequential games, depending uh, what, um, how you think about people's information at various times in the game. Okay? So th those are the basic two things we're going to look at. And we're going to step back and look at the Nash equilibrium concept a little bit, play with that. Um, there's a kind of a deeper question now is that, once we understand what Nash equilibria are, and you still probably you think, you know, what is this? It's just a name at the moment we're using, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a very deep concept about strategic interaction, about what people are going to do, what they believe others are going to do, uh, and how it all fits together. What happens when you have more than one Nash equilibrium? Okay, like we've seen games where there are several Nash equilibria, and those games where there are multiple Nash equilibria we call coordination games. Okay, and we went very quickly in class, and it's quite nicely done in the text about some stylized two by two simultaneous co coordination games: chicken, um, assurance, pure coordination, stag hunt, those kind of games. Okay, and you want to get an idea what is the what is the problem in each one of those games. And what, how, do we, how do we go now? If we've got multiple Nash equilibria, and Nash equilibria is our idea of making predictions, what do we predict? Okay, and there's an important idea called the focal point, uh, which is, makes game theory more of an art than a science, but it's, it's an interesting art. Okay? We, we, and we'll place for some chocolate bars when we do that. And then uh, next week, we're going to turn after the exam, which is on Friday night, trying to remind you. Um, the... Um, Next week, we're going to turn to this question, well, what about games that don't have Nash equilibria? Okay. And the idea if they don't have a Nash equilibria, we can't use our basic theory of the game theory to try to predict, because game theory is built around the idea of uh, what a Nash equilibria is. So what do you do then? And this is where um, uh, John Nash, one of the reasons that John Nash got his Nobel Prize was he was able to show that if you introduce kind of another element of surprise into games without uh, Nash equilibria um, in the pure strategies, you can have what are called mixed strategies, and there's always a Nash equilibria in mixed strategies. Okay? And we'll, we're going to play around with that. It's quite an interesting, interesting uh, sort, of, sort of concept. 
But first, now I, I'm, I'm going to put down a definition of a national equilibrium. I did not put it on the handout for you uh, because one is it's a good idea to write things down sometime. And the the last few lectures, we've been kind of talking about Nash Equilibria. I've been saying what it is a little bit, talking around about it, but we really haven't kind of sit down and defined it. Okay. So we have this PDIP structure of a game. We have who are the players, what can they do, what's their information, what are their payoffs. There's all that stuff that is, is we use as our basic theory of games. And the idea of a Nash Equilibrium is a, is a list of strategies, one for each player. So here, I mean, imagine we got three players, a red, a blue, and a green, and then you know, there's a bunch of other players in a game, any kind of game. Uh, they, they have strategies. Now remember, a strategy is a complete specification of what the player will do in all of the circumstances they find themselves in the game. In the simple simultaneous games we have, strategies are easy. They're just the columns and rows of the little tables. Okay? And we saw that in the... Um, Sequential games that get a little more tricky because you have to worry about all these what-if possibilities as you get farther out in the game. But the concept of a strategy is a complete plan of action. Okay, so we write them down in a list, and I put a little asterisk beside it, a little star, because there's some special strategies. Nash equilibria are special ones. Okay, that's we're putting a little asterisk there. They have some nice properties, and the idea is that every component of that list of strategies is a best response to every other component. Okay, so remember when we did this best response reasoning in the little two by two tables and things like that, that was pretty straightforward to do. And what we could do is we could, you know, other players do this, what's my best response? Other players do that, what's my best response? Other players do this, what's my best response? So you're trying to figure out for all of, you know, for the red player, all of the possible things that the other guys could do, you know, what's my best response? And that's really called a best response function because it's not only a best response to these ones with the asterisk, but we're trying to figure out what would be your best response to anything these other people could do. Okay, so you're sort of sitting there thinking, oh, if they do this and that's their strategies, then this would be my best response. And if they do something else, this would be my best response. We kind of work that through and we call that a best response function, which will tell us a player's best response no matter what the other players do. But in a Nash equilibrium, what we're doing is we're saying, well, imagine all these other strategies with the asterisk. The blue guy, the green guy, the black guy. This one here is red player's best response to that. Okay. Now, this, this is red's action or his plan of action. Okay. It, but it's based on what other people do. And yet, you know, uh, here you might not know what they do, but you can figure out what they do and put them in that list. And here's their beliefs. Okay, just imagine. Forget about the black player. Just imagine we got, you know, we got red, green, and blue. So we got the colors. It's like the 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 list of Nash equilibria represents. I mean, it's just a list. We just write it down. It's, you know, we come up after we figure out what it is. But then, what does it mean? Well, it means something different for each player. For the red player. It indicates what he's going to do, but also what he's going to believe about what other people are going to do. Remember, I kept asking you that question as we did all our toy games. What are you going to do? What do you expect other people are going to do? And then the key idea is, oh, given what you expect other people are going to do, am I making a best response to um, what I think they're going to do? Okay. But it also means something for the other players. So let's put in what the blue player does. Well, for the blue player, the blue player is going to do this and have beliefs about what the other guys are going to do. Okay? So the blue player, the, the Nash equilibrium is also a specification of actions and beliefs for the blue player, and the similarly for the green player. And so the idea is that though it's a very simple concept, you know, we started off just with this, let me just, I'll put these back up in a second. We, it's, a Nash equilibria is defined like this. It actually means something for each player. And what it means is it's, it's specifying what actions and beliefs Everybody's holding, okay? And so, and that's kind of interesting because in strategic interaction for intelligent rational people, that's basically the way we interact. You know, you do things because you expect other people to be behaving certain ways, you know? So when I drive out of here and I get on Pampanui Road, I drive on the left-hand side, okay? And I'm hoping everybody else, 
you know, drives on the left-hand side coming the other way, right? And it's like, you know, you could ask, why do you drive on the left-hand side, John? And you'd say, well, there's a law. Well, even if there wasn't a law, I would drive on the left-hand side because I believe everybody else is going to drive on the left-hand side. And they're driving on the left-hand side because they believe everyone else is driving on the left-hand side. And we all mutually believe these things, and we don't need a law. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to have it codified in case somebody deviates from the law and you have to go and sue them or something like that. Um, but it's more, hey, wait a second, we're all doing this because our expectations fit together. Okay? And believe me, when they don't fit together, it can be a real problem. When I first moved here from Canada quite a long time ago, um, I used to have a real problem at turning intersections. And, and the thing is, when you, in North America, you're driving on the right-hand side, and you know, you're thinking in your head, okay, left-hand side, left-hand side, left-hand side, but then something will happen, it's go, oh, you go the wrong way. Okay, so it's that, you know, there's these beliefs that people have about uh, what other people are going to do, and they, given their beliefs, we figure out, okay, this, this is what I believe. What am I doing? Am I doing the best thing for me in light of what I believe you guys are going to do? And so, we, so you have to march that through for every player, not just for yourself. Okay. So you, you have to do it like for each player. So it, it, that's another kind of level of the intelligence here is you have to be able to put yourselves in the shoes of the other players in the game and try to figure out what their best responses are so you can work out what this Nash equilibrium is. You can't just do it by thinking, oh, you know, what are other people going to do? What's my best response? Because what you have to do is think, well, the other guys, what they're going to do is going to be, they're going to be thinking about what I'm doing and trying to make a, a best response to what I'm doing. And I have to work all that stuff out to come up with a Nash equilibrium. It's mutual best responses, but they're also people's beliefs. <laughs> okay? So simultaneously, this list of strategies, Nash equilibrium, is what people will do, but it's also what others expect other people to do. So you've got beliefs and actions. Now, let's, let's take that idea back to um, uh, what we did yesterday. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on this next little bit be, uh, that's in the text in, um, in the middle of chapter 5. There's a little example about why, why wouldn't you play it safe in a game you know, when you can get a guaranteed outcome? Why would you ever play an Ash Equilibrium that might be risky? Okay? When, we'll, I'm, if we've got time, we'll come back to that, but let's just put that aside for a second. Now, what I did, and this is your first overhead, uh, I mean, it's already all filled out for you, but what we did is we looked at our entry deterrence game, and we tried to think, okay, the strategies for the blue player, there's four of them, which we wrote down as lists. The first component of the list is what they'll do up here at node B1, that is, if the red guy invests, and down here at B2, if the red guy doesn't invest. So this is, these are the four possibilities. There's, those are the four strategies, okay? And then... Uh, Here's the strategies for the red player. He only appears once in the game, so he only has two simple strategies. And we filled out the rest of these, these cells, and we came up with uh, something like this. Okay. Then quickly, we went through the red's best responses. Now, again, once you see a payoff table, uh, uh, and particularly in an exam, you will see a few payoff tables, um, you should be able to work out the best response functions for each player. So for the red player, it's like, okay, I'm the column player, sorry, I'm the row player. Given the blue player does this, two is better than one. Given the blue player does that, four is better than one. Given the blue player does this, three is better than two. Given the blue player does this, uh, four is better than three. And you put the little best responses to just indicate what they are. Then do the same for the blue player. Okay, the blue player is thinking, okay, if the red player does this, I can get a 1 or a 1 or a 3 or a 3, depending on what I do. Just mechanically mark off the Xs where their best responses are. There might be more than one. doesn't matter. Put them all in. Do the same across the rows here. Uh, fours and fours are better than twos and twos. And then we noticed ah, two mutual best responses. And we called these two guys, Nash Equilibria. And I put them in different colors today because I want to compare them. Okay, I want to think, what's going on in these Nash Equilibria? Now, remember the Nash Equilibria, though I circled the payoffs, the Nash Equilibria aren't the payoffs. The Nash Equilibria are the strategies. Okay? The strategy for the red player in the green Nash Equilibria is invest. The strategy for the blue player in the green Nash Equilibria is not invest or not enter up here and enter down there. Okay, so those are the two strategies. Now remember, strategies are simultaneously actions and beliefs for these different players in the game. 
So what about the purple guy? You know, where did that come from? Well, it's a Nash equilibria. It's a mutual best response, and it involves always entering up here and playing, uh, uh, planning to not invest down there. Now, let's, let's just stop and think about that. This pair of strategies, for the red player, this is what he's going to do. This is what he believes the other guy is going to do. Okay? Now, implicit in that belief is, oh, if he gets to node B2, he's going to enter. If he gets to node B1, he's going to enter. Okay. Now, down here, if the red player is playing non this is what I'm going to do. I don't expect the guy, I mean, I expect to end up here, but I'm thinking as a red player that the blue player is going to be up here if we got up to B1. That is, if I don't invest, what's he going to do? Okay. Similarly with the green. The green is a pair of strategies. The, the, in this strategy, there's a different set of actions and beliefs. Okay, for the red player, he's going to invest, which means he's going to move along this branch. And the strategy for the blue player is to not enter at this branch, but it also has a component which says what the blue player would do down at this branch down here. Okay? So let's, let's have a look a little bit deeper at what these beliefs and actions are. Okay? Now, we, we isolated the rollback equilibrium, uh, which we've done several times now, and what the beliefs in this rollback equilibrium are such that we expect the path of play to go for the red player to choose I. That's what he's going to do. We expect him to believe the blue player is going to not enter. And the blue, in this path of play, the blue player will not enter. But the red player is believing that in this sub-game down here, okay, the blue player will enter. And that seems a reasonable thing to do because four is better than two. Okay? So we call that a, it, it, it's a reasonable belief to have. Right? So we call it a credible belief. It's credible because, well, the blue player could do anything. If, I mean, we plan to go along here, but if we did something else, he might do something else. What should I believe that he would do? Well, you should believe that if he gets into situations, he will generally act in his own interest. Okay? And that's what he does here. So we call that a, a, a credible belief. And this equilibrium we call a perfect equilibrium. The idea of perfection has to do with, I mean, there's imperfect actions and perfect actions, okay? But sort of think of it as, well, people are acting rationally in the situations they get themselves in, even though we don't actually get into those situations and we don't expect to in this game. But that doesn't, it, it's not important that we don't get there. What matters is what people will believe about what would happen if we got there, okay? So let's, take out the uh, rollback equilibrium and look at this other equilibrium. This other equilibrium is action for the red player, not invest. Strategy for the blue, or an action and strategy for the red player, not invest. And action, actions in, which are strategies in different situations for the blue player. And you can think of this as, I'm always going to enter. Okay? And if you like, if you go up to this node up here, which you can think of as a little subgame by itself, so in this, we want to analyze this subgame. What, what are people expecting to happen in this subgame? It's, it's not actually going to happen if the equilibrium gets played out. So we call it an out of equilibrium kind of play. It's a what if. Um, well, what would happen if the red player invests? In this equilibrium, the red player is believing the other guy is going to enter. And you could think of that as an implicit threat because look what happens. If he doesn't enter, it's better for the red player. And if he enters, the red player is going to get hurt. Okay? So it's like, oh, the, the blue player is going to hurt me. It's true. He's going to hurt you okay? if he enters. But he also hurts himself. Okay? And that's why in this equilibrium, thinking, well, why would I think he would do something that would hurt himself? If we get into that situation, he wouldn't do it. I shouldn't believe that he would really act against his own interest if we got into that situation. I mean, that's, that's one way you can analyze this. It's like, this is a Nash equilibrium. It's based on a set of beliefs about what people are going to do and uh, in situations they find themselves in the game. But you, know, you ask this question. You question people's beliefs. Why do you believe that? Okay. And you say, well, gee, when I look at it in the sub-game, I think he's going to hurt me. 
And you say, well, yes, why, is, why do you think he's going to hurt you when his payoffs really are to not hurt you, to not enter? Now, in another game, if you didn't know what the payoff structure was and you're worried about this person hurting you, okay, that could be a problem. But here we know his payoffs, and you think, well, he's not going to act against his own interest. I don't have to believe that he will hurt me. And so what we say is that here is that at B2, there's a, there's a strategic threat at B2, okay? These beliefs in this equilibrium involve a, the kind of an implicit threat. It's implicit in that nobody is saying anything. There are no messages going back and forth here, okay? All there are strategies, but strategies are beliefs. You don't need messages if you have belief, you know? If you believe that you are going to go to hell after you die, that will affect how you live now, okay? If you believe that you're going to go to heaven after you die, you know, that will affect how you're going to behave. It's like people's beliefs, they're, they're fundamental about what things, they're not, they're not in these situations, okay? You know, if you, you know, this is a classic example that guys have, you know, and I remember trying to ask a girl on my first date, it was like grade 11, and I, I really wanted to go to the school dance, but I just didn't have the courage, and I sat there for about a day, you know, should I phone her, should I phone her, should I phone her, and what am I going to say? It's like, what ifs? All of these things, you know? And uh, if it hadn't been for pressure from my friends, I just wouldn't have done it, okay? It's like, you know, I'm too afraid of getting rejected. That's just what I believe I am going to get rejected, so I won't ask, okay? Whereas on the other hand, if, you, if you're confident, you think, oh, yeah, you know? Uh, I'm the cat's meow, she's going to love me, and then I'll just go ahead and do it. Okay, your beliefs affect... Uh, uh, you know, what you're going to do, and then you should ask questions about your beliefs. Why would I believe? Why would I believe the blue player would hurt me? So, this Nash equilibrium down here, we call a imperfect equilibrium. It's, it is a Nash equilibrium, okay? That is, it's a, a set of strategies, a list of strategies, such as each player is making the best response to the other player. Those strategies are, uh, mutual, so it's mutual best response, in those strategies are embodied a set of beliefs. But there's something a little puzzling or curious. I don't want to say wrong, but it's, it's more like, well, if you think about it a bit deeper, the beliefs that are in this Nash equilibrium don't make as much sense as the belief in the rollback equilibrium. Why is that? Because you're believing here the other guy would hurt you when really it's against their interest to hurt you if they come into the game. Okay, so let's... We, what I've, overall, what we can do is we call these rollback equilibria sub-game perfect equilibria. Okay, so if you like, in the games that we're looking at now, the rollback equilibria has been a way of finding Nash equilibria. I say, we we look look forward, reason back, work through a game tree. We didn't talk about Nash equilibria at all. But it, and then we got into simultaneous games. We're talking about Nash equilibrium left, right, and center. Think, oh, we were really doing Nash equilibrium at the beginning there. But it's a certain kind of Nash equilibrium. It's a what we call subgame perfect. Is that people have believe other people act in their best interest in situations they get themselves into. They won't uh, believe threats in this game or promises in other games that aren't credible. Okay, so the idea. Uh, this, in chapter 10, we're going to we'll plumb out this idea of credibility because in promises and threats, we're going to start to have some messages going back and forth now. You know, if you do this, I'll do that kind of stuff. So people are promising other people to do stuff, and you think, well, yeah, but, but when they get out there, are they really going to follow through on their promises? Okay? And that's the credibility question. You know, or, or they're going to make a threat, but when they get out there, are they really going to carry through in that threat? So... Uh, even in this simple game, we have um, the idea of credible threats, and if we had a promise game, we could have, we'd have credi credible excuse me, promises. So that's, this is an important idea, okay? And it, it helps, once you see the definition of Nash equilibria, and we go back to this little table I had, this little picture, is that the concept of an equilibrium is kind of mechanical. You think, oh, what's Nash equilibrium? What's, you know, st strategy? Well, it's about people's, what they do. They interact with one another. They make choices. They have behaviors. But they also believe things about how other people are going to react. And the Nash equilibria idea embodies in it not only what some assumptions about rationality, people make best responses, you know, to whatever, and to whatever else they, they believe, but certain things about what they believe. Okay, it's beliefs and actions together. So when we talk about Nash equilibria in a strategic game, we're talking about a set of mutually consistent beliefs and actions. Now, 
let me just go back to what I left out here. You can scratch this down if you like, but I, I didn't put it on the handout because it's on page 141 in the text. This is a, a stylized game. Okay, it was just kind of drawn up to draw your attention to problems of riskiness in games, uh, in, these, in these simultaneous games. And if you, if you go through the analysis of all the payoffs, okay, the, for the red guy, best responses are two and two, because that's better than one. Three is better than two and two. Three is better than zero and two. So we put in the knots there. And for the blue guy going across the rows, two twos are better than a one, a two and a three. Oh, sorry, the three is better than the two twos. Blah, blah, blah. The three here is better than zero and two. And so there's only one cell that has mutual best responses. Okay, so there's, this would be, say, if you were playing a simultaneous game, and if these are the payoffs of the players, and if they're intelligent enough to figure out what's going on, and they all know the components of the game, then each of them should expect this Nash equilibrium. The red player will play T, expecting the blue guy to do A, the blue guy will play A, expecting the red guy to do T. And the reason is because that's the only pair of strategies in this game with, that are mutual best responses. Okay? And, and okay, now that's, how does that work? And you say, well, one of the objections to this game is that if the red player played B, they would get two or two or two. They would get the same as they could in the Nash Equilibria, too. And it wouldn't matter what the other guy did. Okay? So you sort of think, that's a safe course of action. If I play B as a red player, then uh, definitely I'm going to get two. So I was like, and that, that's just as good as I can get in the, in the Nash Equilibrium. So I'm going to be the cautious guy and play okay, B. Okay, that's right. What do you think the blue player is going to do? And what does the blue player think you're going to do? And you sort of think, well, they're both trying to figure out what they, if, if, the, if the blue player expects me to play B, okay, what's his best response? Well, his best response is B, okay? So I'm thinking, okay, I'm a conservative guy. I want to be cautious. I want to get two for sure, uh, no matter what the other, guy, the other guy gets. Well, I sort of want that, but, you know, I'm also self-interested. And if I am doing this, and the other guy is predicting that I'm doing this, then what do I think he's going to do? Well, I think he will play B. But if he plays B, then I can do better for myself. I mean, it's like, oh, okay, I can do better for myself. I can, I can play T. I can get three rather than two. I could stay here and be cautious, but then I wouldn't be playing best response. I wouldn't be self-interested. And, you know, if, if this is a possible thing for us to believe, mutually believe together, as long as the other guy is intelligent enough to predict that I'm cautious, then he's going to play B, in which case I shouldn't be cautious, I should just play T, but he should also predict that, okay? That I won't be cautious because if I was cautious, then he would play B, I would play T, and then given I play T, um, he's better at playing A. So we'd end up at A in that reasoning process. So th the purpose of this example is to think, well, why is Nash equilibrium so useful as a prediction device, and there's a, a key question is, well, why not? What else would you think people would expect? Okay, it's, it's, it really is, it's like, okay, Nash equilibrium, there's one here, it's kind of hard to work out, but once you work it out, both and intelligent players, if they got enough time, could actually work it out. Uh, that seems a sensible thing to do, but why not something else? You know, what else could they jointly believe? And here, we're sort of thinking, well, let's believe the red player will play B. Everybody believes the red player will play B but then the blue player would, would play B. But then the red player wouldn't want to play B because he wouldn't be making the best response, okay? And so he would want to play T. And if he plays T, the other guy's going to play B. So kind of here, all roads lead back to the Nash equilibrium, okay? Now, let's, uh, we had a little problem. We had a problem in this game here where we have two Nash equilibrium, multiple Nash equilibrium, but in the other games we've seen, the minimum effort game, there were many Nash equilibria. I mean, there were some that were really good, four and four rather than zero and zero, but there were still many Nash equilibria. And how do we figure out what a, um, uh, Nash equilibria to choose, okay? And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna play a little simple game. It's a coordination game and it's called color match. So 
the color match goes like this. Uh, blue players could be in this aisle over here, and the red players can be in that aisle over there. And you guys have got to choose a color, okay? One color. The blues can choose gold, yellow, or red. You're going to be anonymously paired with somebody over on the other side, a red player, who can choose blue, blue green, or black, okay? So they're going to pair up. And if what's going to happen is, I will give you two chocolate bars each if you get the right match. So blue players, you know, sit there and think about what are you going to do. Um, and I'll just come up the aisle and pick a couple of people at random. And I'll pick a couple of people at random from the other side, the red players. You guys figure out what you're going to do. But while you're doing that, try to figure out what the other guy is going to do as well. Okay? So just take a minute or two. And I take my bag of chocolate bars and... If you make a match, I will give you two chocolate bars each. It's a simultaneous game. Two players. Each of them's got three things to do. They've got to choose a color. And in this particular matching game, if your colors match according to these lines, you know, if green matches with yellow, and if gold matches with blue, and black matches with red, I will give you two chocolate bars. Otherwise, you get nothing. I'm not going to penalize you or anything. Just that, okay? Yeah, I want you in. Just, if you're in the aisle, draw, write something down, because in about a minute, I'm going to come up and ask you what you've written down, okay? And again, you sit, and what you're thinking is important, too. Same with the house over there. choosing that one there, okay? Okay, what's your name? Eric. Eric. So Eric, uh, Eric and, and Joel, you're going to go together. You don't know what your things are. And we got Tristan. And okay, I'm going to hit you guys again. Okay, here. So did you... Okay. And what's your name again? Karen. Uh, Karen and Tristan, okay? So um, Tristan, what, what did you choose? You chose yellow? Blue. Yellow and blue. Okay, so... Did they get a match? Doesn't match up. Sorry, no chunk of bars. Okay. It was Eric, right? Yep. Eric, you chose gold. Joel, what did you choose? Uh, oh, sorry, you chose blue and you chose gold? Okay, so you guys got a, you got a match. Okay. Two chunk of bars. So, Joel, what were you thinking about when you were trying to choose a color, about what the other guy was going to do? Okay, so what Joel said was, uh, top left for him was blue. It's kind of really not the top, it's sort of the middle side, right? And no, he chose gold. What did I win? Pardon? Yeah, okay, the goal is the top left, and you were thinking, well, they might go for the top left over there. Eric, what were you thinking when you did it? Uh, I was kind of thinking, like, the gold ones were in a gold. <laughs> okay, so it's like, what's think, what, they, what they're thinking about is totally different, right? Now, it was, it was interesting, in one of the classes uh, I did a few years back, um, the there was a player who wrote down a little payoff matrix, which I will do for you right now. Just put it up. It's quite easy to do, right, in this game. Um, it's, a, it's a little two-by-two two sort of game. Uh, blue, black, green, red, gold, blah, 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 put in the payoffs. And you can come up 
with your Nash equilibria in those three cells. The problem is, I mean, basically, it's, this is a pure coordination game, okay? It's a three by three pure coordination game, but it's like you just need to get coordinated, but there's several things you could get coordinated on, okay? And so what you have to, what we want to do is try and figure out a way to coordinate your beliefs. And that's called, we want a convergence of expectations. And there's a theory about, according to Thomas Schelling, which is um, called focal point reasoning, F-O-C-A-L, focal point. So what, what would focus, you know, like Eric had a totally different explanation for what was going on than Joel did. Okay, let me introduce you to another simple game uh, where it's actually more complicated. Okay, here's a list of 10 cities. 10 cities in, the, in New Zealand. But towns, perhaps. I don't know. I hope they're all cities. And what I want you to do is people on this side choose five, and people on that side choose five. Okay? And if you choose the same five, I'll give you ten chocolate bars. And you think, what hope is there? Right? We, well, supposing I just change it a little bit, so we get rid of this green shape, and... I put in a, a map. I copied the weather map off the, the web behind there. And one thing about this map is that it's kind of like a background knowledge for most people in New Zealand. And five of the cities are in the North Island, and five of the cities are in the South Island. Okay? So if both of your, if people are sitting there thinking, well, okay, I've got to come up with a match. They've got to come up with a match. There's a whole bunch of possibilities we could coordinate. I have no idea what they're going to be thinking. But if we both knew that we're thinking about a map, okay, then you could pick five from the North Island. They could pick five from the South Island. And you'd and, uh, um, you get your matches. Okay? So the idea here is that you can use some sort of context knowledge to help focus your expectations. Here, the... Um, the map gives you some hope that you, you, know, you guys could select the same stuff, right? So that's, the, that's just an idea about focal point reasoning. It's something outside the game that people might know about one another that would help them converge their beliefs or expectations about what other people are going to do. Okay. Uh, now, before I go on with this... Um, uh, focal point kind of reasoning. Whoops, I'm dropping chocolate bars left, right, and center here. Should we just see if you're awake up there? Okay, guys. Everybody just want a chocolate bar? Okay. Um, I want to turn back and look at the second question, which was, okay, we've looked at how a psych sequential game could be represented as a simultaneous game. Sorry. That's right. Now we want to look at can a simultaneous game be represented as a sequential game. And the answer to that is yes. Um, supposing I have a simple simultaneous game like this. Okay. It, it's going to be turn, turn out to be like the, the uh, enter deterrence game in that there's an invest, not invest, enter, not enter. These are the pattern of payoffs we have. And again, you could go through and, you know, you do your best response analysis. Two is better than one, four is better than three. Three is better than one, four is better than two. So the red guy's got a dominant strategy. Blue player doesn't have a dominant strategy. You know, work it through and solve it, okay? But here, we don't want to just solve the game. We don't want to think about the game as a sequential game. So let's try... writing the game down this way, where the red player moves first, okay? So here, if you're looking at this sequential game, sorry, if you're looking at this simultaneous game, and you wanted to think, well, a simultaneous game, neither player can see what the other player is doing. Supposing we change it into a game where the red player moves first, the blue player can observe what they're doing, look at their payoffs, and map out, okay, if the red player does I and the blue player does E, they get one and one. So that's up there. The red player does I and the blue player does N and E, that's three and three. And then two and four, four and two. Okay, so that's just our entry deterrence scheme. So if we actually change the nature of the game from a simultaneous to a sequential, then we could draw a game tree for it. But how can we represent the idea that in this simultaneous game, 
the blue player doesn't see what the red player has done. And the, what we do is we introduce a concept called an information set. And an information set is like a, a node, or sometimes you can think of it as a, a, a line, if you like, be joining, uh, joining various nodes in a graph where the player is going to move can't tell it, it, where they are in the game tree. Now, it would almost be better to say a lack of information set in that what we're, th what we're doing here is we're saying in the original, let me just work with this uh, circle rather, in the original game, the blue player can observe directly what the other, where he is in the game tree. Okay? He can see that the red player invests, see that the red player doesn't invest, and then he makes his move. So, you know, that's one type of game with one type of information. But another game is well, the red player moves first, but the blue player doesn't observe what the red player does. That means when the blue player makes their choice, they're not sure whether they're up here or here. They can't distinguish between these two nodes. So we loop them together like in one big node. We're just not sure where we're at. Now, what you, could, what you might want to think about then is if you're not sure where you're at, you can only make one choice, right? You can't say, oh, if I'm up here, I'm going to enter, and down there, I'm, not gonna, I'm going to not enter, because, I mean, you can't have that contingent plan of action, because you're never going to be able to implement it. You can't observe what happens. You've got to make a choice not knowing what happens. And it could be that you'll be up here, and it could be that you'll down there, be down there. So if you like, we can kind of gray out these other possibilities and say, well, you can either choose to enter or not enter. But your payoffs, of course, will depend what the other guy's done. You know, if you choose enter and the other guy's chosen I, then you'll end up over here. And if you choose enter and the other guy's chosen NI, you'll end up over here. So, I mean, we, we want to keep track of the payoffs you'll, you actually will have. But basically, it's like saying you have to do the same thing at each node in the information set. Let me say that again. Just step back. We... When, on an information set, which masks where a person is in a game tree, so we, we put a big loop or um, loop together these nodes in the tree where you don't know where you are, and you, you can do several things, but you can't change what you're going to do for the nodes in the information set. So let's get rid of this. I would say you can choose to enter, but really you're choosing to enter for all of the points in that information set, all of the nodes in the information set. You have to do the same thing at each node in the information set. And why is that? Well, that's because in this game, you can't tell where you are. You can make a choice, enter or not enter, but you could end up here, you could end up there. Now, this is a different kind of game. It's a game of imperfect information now, okay? Because now you're starting to have some uncertainty about, well, what's the other guy going to do? So, so far we've looked at, we're, we're starting to introduce this notion of uncertainty. We, we don't have any probabilities or anything, anything like that yet. But what we do have in the game tree is you don't know where you are. You, don't know, you can't see what other people have done. Now, that's the way in which we model simultaneous play in a sequential game. Now, it turns out if, if we, we could do, have exactly the same sequential game turned around, but have the blue player move first, have the red player move second, map out their payoffs. Notice I've changed the colors because of the little convention that blue guys go first, red guys go second. Put the information set around the, the red players, and that means that the red player can't see what the blue player has done, though in the, you could think of the blue players moving first, but the red player just can't see it. Okay. So the way we introduce in a sequential game this idea Oh, sorry. The way we introduce this, change a simultaneous game into a sequential game, and you know, if I was asking you on a test, uh, represent this. I don't think I'm going to ask you this in a test, okay? But if I was, um, the the idea of you represent this game as a as a sequential game, you could do it this way, or you could do it that way. Okay, both of them are are equally valid because in this game here, the red player has to make their choice, not knowing what the blue player is going to do. The blue player here makes their choice not knowing what the red player is going to do, and that's what simultaneous stuff is about. Okay? Similarly over here, the blue player makes their choice first, so they don't know what the other player is going to do. The red player moves second, but can't see what the blue player has done, can't observe it, so we put those two in an information set, and uh, that captures that element of simultane simultaneity in a game. Okay. So that's how to represent 
a simultaneous game in sequential game form. But remember, now you can you could do it either way. Okay. Now, what I did is uh, we got a few minutes, three minutes left. Whatever you do, don't copy this down. It is not going to be in the exam. It's just a way of thinking about um, how you might use these ideas, uh, sequential game, simultaneous game, focal points, and coordination problems. in a kind of more complicated fashion, okay? So please, do not, don't draw this down. I mean, it took me <laughs> a couple of hours to draw this, so I'm not going to ask you to do something like this on a test, okay? Uh, uh, to, to actually get the thing right. And the way the game, the, the, the game is the battle of the sexes. And the, the idea is the red player is the man, he likes to go to football. The blue player is the woman, she likes to go shopping. Nice, you know, stereotypical type things. Uh, if they, they, they both really would like to do something together, go to the footy is uh, um, a, higher, a good preference for the man. He prefers that than going, to, going shopping. But they'd both rather be doing something together than not doing it here. Okay? So that's kind of like a, the, the standard battle of the sexes. Only now, there's some pre-play communication. Where in this case, I've said, let's just send a message. How do we coordinate? Well, I'd say, oh, I'm going to football. Or I'm going shopping. Okay? Something like that. Now, this is a very simple way of, of getting coordination, but it also creates some problems. Okay? So let's have a look. The, um, if, if we think of the first stage of the game, it's like, let's supposing that the red player gets to send a message to the blue player. Okay? And the message can say, I'm going to the footy. And the message could say, I'm going to go shopping. Okay? And then after they send the message, they have to play out this simultaneous game. Well, the simultaneous game is, you can, we can think of as, well, uh, footy, shopping, footy, you're shopping, footy, you're shopping, but the blue player can't tell in the Battle of Sexes what the red player has actually done. They can see back here the message is, they went to the football, okay, but up here they have to make the choice. They know what the message is, but they can't really see whether the person went to the football or not, okay? Um, I'm putting it down here. The guy says he's going to go shopping, but did he go to the football game instead? Okay. At the time that the blue player makes the decisions, all they, all they, they can't see what the action is of the red player, but they can hear the message. Okay. So we get, if you like, we have the, these two games, sub-games with information sets boil down to the battle of the sexes. And then I built a little table out of that. You don't want to do this, okay, because it takes a little while to work out what all the strategies are. But essentially, we're looking at a situation like this. And it, it's kind of interesting, okay, because it really is. Now we're getting into the battle of the sexes uh, a little more deeply with some messages that are going on. So the idea is along this branch, the guy says he's going to the footy, and then the day comes. They can't see what one of those is going to do. How are they going to coordinate? Okay? And over here, he says he's, he's, he said he's gone shopping. The day comes. Uh, are they going to go to, is he actually going to go to the footy or go shopping? And is she going to go to the footy or go shopping? So they have to play this game at a subsequent stage. Notice now we're blending two things, part sequential, part simultaneous. What are the strategies? Well, the red player can say footy and go to the footy. Or he could say footy and go shopping. Or he could say shopping and go to the footy. Or you could say shopping and go shopping. So we put all the strategies down there like that. And the say, it's what I, what I say and what I do. Okay? And, and the blue player can hear messages. Okay? And so we say, well, if she hears footy, she could do FRS. If she hears shopping, she could do FRS. And these are the possibilities. This is always going to the footy. Okay? It's like, ignore the guy's message. You know, no matter what he says, just go to the footy. Okay? Or over here, ignore the message. No matter what he says, go shopping. And here it's like, Okay, he says he's going to the footy. I'll go to the footy. He says he's going shopping. I'll go shopping. Okay, that's where I put in this hear and obey thing. And this, the other one is, well, he said he's going to the footy, so I'm going shopping. And he says he's going shopping, so I'm going to the footy. I'm doing just the opposite. When you have your own teenagers, you'll see that this is not an impossible strategy. Okay, so we put down all the strategies, map them all out, look at all the Nash equilibrium, and all of the Nash equilibrium are very, very interesting. Okay, on the, I'm, I'll put this other overhead up on the, for you, but basically you can have lots of different combinations of, you know, the guy says and does what he wants, which is to go to the footy. The woman ignores the message, goes to the footy anyhow, okay?
That's an equilibrium. Here he says one thing, what he wants, but he does another thing. Okay? That's uh, item C down here. So here he's inconsistent between his actions and his words. Similarly here, there's an inconsistency between his action and his words. And it's like, you know, relationships are like to get very confusing. People say some things, they do other things, but here you can work out what's their best response. Okay? Well, one, one thing that's the best response to inconsistent action, like here the guy says, I'm going shopping, going to the footy, you know that's going to happen, so you just go to the footy. Or, you know what's going to happen, uh, you just ignore it, you miss one another, or you know what's going to happen, and you do exactly the opposite, and wow, lo and behold, you're coordinated. Okay? So, here you can take a simple message game, where people can hear messages, tack onto it a simultaneous game where there's a bit of simultaneity and uncertainty about what happens, and come up with some, here's all the Nash equilibria. And then you ask, well, what actually is going to happen? Well, in every relationship that you know, okay, you know different things, you know, sometimes guys do what they, they say and sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes people ignore messages, sometimes they hear them and obey them, other times they hear them and ignore them, and it's like, what is it that determines those particular choices? And that's where the focal point stuff, there's something else, you know, some context, some culture, some history together that ends up where these things can be equilibrium. Great. Okay, so that's all on uh, coordination games. Next week, we're going to look, after the exam, we're going to look at uh, mixed strategies.